This is a high-grade special on gender equality in mining. What can men tell us about women in mining? Glyn Cochran combines the academic perspective with extensive experience on the ground. Always insightful, always thought-provoking. Stay with us, he will challenge your ideas on gender equality. Glyn, welcome to High Grade. Thank you. Every now and then the mining industry is swayed by societal changes. At the turn of the millennium it was all about sustainable development. Mm. And today we mm. see comparable attention given to gender equality. Yes. But let's start with the basics. What does gender equality mean? I think at present in the mining industry it really means women adjusting to a work environment which has pretty much been determined by men for the last hundred years. I think we have to have a situation which deals much more with women being able to be women in the mining industry and the changes that are necessary to bring that about. My sense is it will require a major effort on the part of the industry, similar to MMSD. It will need cooperation from a number of major companies, it will need lots of studies and they'll have to do a lot of work. Can we talk about an end goal here? Um, and some people say that the end goal should either be equal opportunities or equal outcomes. Does that make sense to you? Well, there is no doubt that we have to have an end goal. And if we look at climate change and other things, we can see that you've got to look a bit forward. We already have the mine of the future. My problem is the mine of the future doesn't seem to have any people. I think we have to have a company of the future and I think we have to have an idea of a community of the future and we have to then see what do those things mean for us. I mean, for example, what will the mining specialty be in a generation from now? Because I think the changes that we want to see happening are going to take a generation. I don't think there's any doubt about it. But is it possible? Let's look at some of the issues that will have to be addressed. We're going to have to take a look at continuity because that is what has kept women really out of the workplace more than anything else. Is there a way that they can be out of the industry for three or five years and come back in again and make a contribution or is there not? But what sort of company will we have in 20 or 30 years time? And that's what we have to work toward. I think the difficulty with doing it incrementally now and looking at targets and champions and things like that and so many jobs, I don't think we're going to get there from that. I think we have to look out to the future and then work back. What can the companies do? The companies can certainly take a much closer look at the kind of environment which they create. At present, the environment is obviously one where women do not feel valued and do not necessarily feel that they belong. They, corporate culture has got to be much more inclusive. It has to be much more attractive to women. It has to be something that they feel they want to join and remain in, not leave and go away. And that means that you've got to really look at it seriously. And that's a lot more than taking a bunch of values that sound good and saying, let's all, have, let's all live the values. You have really got to do the same kind of analysis at corporate headquarters as we do in the community. Changing a culture, that takes time. A lot of companies now are trying to push that change by using targets. What's your opinion on this? I don't know how they set the targets, but the question is... 50-50. Is well, but is it really addressing the key issue? Because the other thing that I'm, I suppose I'm fairly convinced about in my own mind is you ought not to deal with women in mining as a standalone issue. It has got to be dealt with in a much broader context of social performance. The problem now with social performance in the mining industry is that boards of directors of major companies tend to regard these issues as operational issues and something that ought to be sorted by the CEO and his team. So therefore, even when we have a diverse board, it does not necessarily have an impact on this issue. The second difficulty that I see there is rewards and remuneration in the, in the mining industry are short term. Mm -hmm. We are talking about generational change. What's in it? for senior executives to plan 20 years ahead. But you know, there have been changes and other, other industries and professions have, have, have illustrated that. For example, 
25 years ago, it was impossible for a woman to get into the University of California at Davis to train to be a vet. Today, 73% of all the vets in the United States are women. They can, it can be done. We have to get to a, a point, I hope that it's possible to get to a point, where, where women can be employed because it is recognized that they have special qualities that men do not have, and that is not the case at present. What would you say their special qualities are then? <laughs> well, uh, this could be very risky indeed, but <laughs> let me try, try and give you a few examples. I think uh, they are much more socially sensitive and that's going to be increasingly important. They are much more careful and comprehensive with looking at facts. They look at the whole thing. They are very good team players and that's good also. And they are hard workers and they set a good example. I think they're ideal employees for the mining industry and the mining industry is losing quite a bit by not having as many women in the places that it ought to have. And also, the turnover is extremely expensive. Glyn, we've talked now about some of the inequalities in, in the workforce, but let's, uh, let's move on to communities, um, and particularly artisanal and small-scale mining. You have encountered many communities specializing in this. Can you talk to me about the gender implications of this artisanal subsistence mining? Well, I spent uh, several years on one of the largest, I think, ASM operations in the world, which had between, say, probably between 20 and 40,000 artisanal miners. The first thing which uh, I thought it was important to do was to get a thorough understanding of the way that, the mi that mining operated there. After a two-year study by university, we discovered it was indeed a social system from top to bottom. People applied discipline, discipline was accepted. The jobs were quite strange. They reminded me in a way of the Industrial Revolution in the north of England because the jobs were fit for men and women and children. At the same time? At the same time. They, the whole family was working on riverine tailings at the same time. It was quite egalitarian. Now, there were obviously serious problems. It was difficult if women, if uh, children were not in school. It was very difficult for women standing in water all day long and getting lesions on their legs. It was, you know, it was hard work. But then what happens, what tends to happen is that grade drops, automation comes, then there is an increasing application of capital. They get generators, they get air hoses, they use chemicals. And the net result of all that is to reduce the amount of employment available for women. So you're saying as the artisanal mines grow, yes. they push out the women. They will, they will tend to be the first victims, you might almost say, of improvement. The improvement is very well intentioned, but it turns out to be not much different from modern mining itself then in the end. And what about communities in general? So mining communities not specializing on ASM. Um, there are plenty of studies looking at the con or the impact of large scale mining on communities. Well, how, how is life for a woman living close to a mine? Well, depends on which part of the world you're in. Let me look at some of the impacts that I've seen. If we take, for example, Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, the impact of mining companies there has been difficult on occasion because in matrilineal societies, men are responsible for looking after their sister's property. But mining companies have never actually discovered how much of the rent they pay to the men actually reaches women because they haven't done their homework on it the way they should have done. Then let's take East, uh, let's take East Africa where you know, to my certain knowledge, in certain instances where women have suddenly arrived in, in mining towns, maybe 50% of everything they own is garnished because they're not quite sure how to handle credit and money. And that's notwithstanding the fact that we know from elsewhere, women are the best payers. They're the best returners on small scale credit. But the companies have not really taken care of what happens to people in that transition. Same thing in that same part of the world. Think of the amount of STDs that are imported into the Lesothos and the Swazilands of this world 
from the mines in South Africa, where I don't think there's really much of a program. Then let's move to South America. I think there, as in a lot of other countries, the impact of withdrawing a large number of men from a traditional community inevitably affects people's lives. In one instance that we had to deal with, there was complete breakdown in the schools and in the education system because the children were extremely unruly. Fathers, who had a very important role in terms of bringing up the children, were no longer present. Mm. And they had not thought how to compensate for that absence. I think we can see overall that what really needs to happen is that people need to understand uh, women in traditional communities much better than they do. This cannot, to my mind, be done by standalone studies. Standalone studies really do not make an awful lot of sense. Over a hundred years ago, James Fraser used to say, you know, he went around the world and he looked in all these places about women jumping over bonfires. And he thought that that must all mean more or less the same thing. But in actual fact, in Russia, probably meant they wanted purification. In Portugal, probably meant they wanted a child. And what it illustrated was the fact that is not being sufficiently addressed in these studies is you must first understand the item of behavior you're looking at in the context of the culture of which it forms a part. That's not what they're doing. A lot of that, I'm sorry to say, I may not be popular for saying it, is because the international agencies have these quick, rapid reconnaissance things that are supposed to, with 15 or 20 questions, answer all the issues you want. I don't think they work. These communities don't stand still. Industrial development accelerates the speed of social change. And what might have been acceptable five, ten years ago may well not be acceptable five or ten years from now. A clever company will see that coming because they will have a pulse on the community. The other will say, well, we did one of those things five years ago and it was all fine. <laughs> but is it the role of the mining companies? The mining companies come in with their values. Is it their role to influence cultural traditions, cultural values in these communities? I would say absolutely not. I mean, if you look at what the mining industry has done with women, are they really in a position to social engineer when it comes to women in traditional communities? I think not. Uh, the reason why they're doing it, I would say, from what I can see, is not because uh, they want to better the condition of women in those societies, it is because they want to make sure that women don't object to the agreements which they're drawing up with them. <laughs> in other words, nobble the opposition. Now that's not a very good reason at all for trying to change. I think it's very presumptuous of us to go to somebody else's country and begin to try to tell, you know. If I look at a traditional community, let me tell you something. Women are not trying to move to another community. Women are not looking for childcare. <laughs> Women are not feeling that they're second class citizens. They're handling the woman problem quite well, I think. Let me ask you a self-reflective question. We are sitting here singling out women as, as, a, as a group. Yes. Uh, from an anthropological yes. perspective, how much sense does that make? If you, Because you were talking about it being a social context. Mm, mm, mm. I don't think that it, uh, that it really is the best way to go about it. I think you have to see women in the context of a much broader organizational situation, whether it's in the community or whether it's in the corporation. The problem that we have to deal with is one of relationships. And the problem that, uh, that we have to deal with is change, but we also have to deal, I think, at the corporate level with a concerted effort to build the kind of organizational environment which is supportive and welcoming as far as women are concerned. That requires a lot more than a quick slogan or uh, a few promotions. So if you were to end on a positive note, <laughs> where, where do you see progress being made? I see progress being made because of two or three factors. One. I think there's going to be increasing societal pressure. And I think mining companies always have to pay attention to that. That's going to happen. I see also an economic case. 
that as mining changes, it's going to become more and more to the advantage of companies to use women to a far greater extent than they have now. I think there's an economic case to be made as well. And I think also, if the companies can make a more attractive organizational environment, the women themselves, instead of wanting to leave, will stay. Clint, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. This is high grade.